My name is Brandon. If you're a guest with us today, you picked an amazing Sunday. It is Father's Day. Any fathers in the house? Anybody bring your father to the house? Awesome. That's great. It's great. It's Father's Day. I just want to acknowledge up front for some of you, um, uh, you have a great earthly dad and you are celebrating dad today. And for others of you, that is not the reality that you're walking in. Uh, So I just want to encourage you today, throughout all of Scripture, when you see broken relationships between the father and their kids, God shows up. And I want to encourage you today that if that's where you're at, God wants to show himself to you in a special way. So be encouraged on Father's Day. And so today, since it's Father's Day, I invited a personal friend of mine um, who, uh, his name's Michael. Michael, come on up here today. Meet Michael and I, uh, we each have four children, and it's not because we like kids. We really like our wives. <laughs> True. True. Uh, <laughs> we married out of our leagues, and we're proud of it. Uh, so it is Father's Day weekend, and, and Michael is a great husband and, and a great father. And you're going to hear some story uh, from his past. It's going to be like, oh, you get me. Uh, so today, uh, as your pastor, I want to welcome today Michael Prasad. Can we give a vibrant welcome online and in person to my friend Michael? I'm really excited to, to be here on Father's Day and to present. Uh, it's kind of a strange thought. Actually, I was just thinking about it uh, as I was getting ready to come on. It probably shouldn't be a great day for me, but it, it's really turned out to be a really great day, uh, Father's Day. It's one of my, one of my favorite days. Um, like Brandon was talking about, I have four kids. I love being a dad. It's one of my favorite things that I get to do. I love being a dad to my kids. Um, I've learned so much about who God is after like, I started having kids around. Like, the, the Bible compares God as a, to, to a father, a good father. And I get to be that. Like, God has redeemed something in my life that I get to be to my kids, and it's taught me so much about who he is as my heavenly father. So today, I want to just unpack what that has looked like for me. What does it look like to make God my heavenly father and go through this journey that um, really it shouldn't be the case that Father's Day is a great day in my life, but it really is because of who God has been uh, in my life. So with that, um, let me get into it, but let's pray real quick. Lord God, I just turn this time over to you and invite you into this place. I thank you, God, that you're going to speak to our hearts today. Lord, uh, use this time, and Lord, I pray that you would just redeem uh, things that need to be redeemed. Uh, You would inspire us, that you would teach us and challenge us. Lord, we give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So a little while ago, I, uh, I read this book, and it really changed a lot uh, for me. Um, in the book, they talked about, the very beginning of the book, it talked about uh, picturing a room, kind of, kind of like this, a room, and it's full of rows of seats, um, and there's dozens and dozens of seats. And in, in the room, in the seats, there's people everywhere. And in the front of that room, there's a box, a large box. It's wooden, and it's very large. And inside that box is me. It's a funeral, and it's my funeral. And then what the the challenge was is to to picture who's in the room. Picture who's in the front rows. And then picture a microphone in the front of the room. And then picture people walking up and saying something what would they say? Who would say it? So it was a challenge. And man, it really, it stuck with me. It's like, wow, if if I want that day to be what I hope it would be, with the right people, so to speak, the right people, the the people that are closest to me, the people that I spent the most time with would be the ones that were in the front row, and they would be the ones that would come up and say whatever it is they need to say to tell my story, their version of my impact on their life then I need to live that now. I need, to, I need to start doing something now so that that becomes a reality in my life. So what, the way I, I want to say it is that I have to realize what story am I telling? What story am I going to tell? And how, t- how can I do that today? How can I shape that story today so that ultimately it becomes a story that, that I want told? And it, it's where my family, the people that are closest to me, are the ones that regard me the highest. 
And I think, I think you're very similar to that. that. That would be the case in your life. You would want the people that are closest to you, that spend the most time with you, that would regard you the highest. You know, there, there's two types of family. There's the, um, the blood family. There's a blood family, our moms, dads, sisters, uh, kids. And then there's a spiritual family. And I think blood family, we, we understand. You know, I, like, <laughs> I've got four kids, and I, I begin to realize that four kids looks a little bit strange. For me, it's normal because I live in it every day. But when I walk out in public, I, I kind of get some looks. Actually, not too long ago, I was walking in my neighborhood, and I saw this couple walking towards me. And I had my four kids, and we're all just kind of walking down the street. Um, and they, they were kind of looking at us funny. And then when I passed by him, the guy looks over, and he's like, are those all yours? <laughs> I was like, yeah, man, they are. <laughs> he couldn't believe it. So there, there's, there's blood family, but there's also a spiritual family. And this is what has made a huge impact in my life. See, when I was, uh, up until I was five, I grew up in, in Guyana. I was born, born in Georgetown, Guyana, Caribbean culture, kind of in South America, but in part of the Caribbean culture. Um, and then I moved to America around five years old, and my whole family moved. I have a brother and a sister, um, that, so we all moved. And we got here, and about five months later, I woke up one morning, and my dad was gone. He had left in the middle of the night, and I'd never really seen him since. Like, he was gone. And I remember in those early days, I felt so like, wow, inadequate. We we grew up in um, a suburban community, and I would look around, and I just felt like I wasn't good enough. I didn't feel like I was good enough. I, I remember my mom at the time, she had a minimum wage job. In fact, when my dad had left, we had to scramble to move out of our house and into something that we can afford um, so we scrambled to do that, and um, I, growing up, I just realized, like, we, we, don't, we don't get to do certain things because we just don't have enough. So I always had that feeling of, like, man, growing up as a kid, I was like, I, I, even now, I think back to it, I was like, man, we just, so, like, so going to a movie, we see a, a great, you know, commercial for uh, the new movie coming out, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie was coming out, I love those guys, but I knew that there's no chance I'm going to be able to see that movie. I just knew it because we didn't have enough money to go do stuff like that. So I, I, this is kind of what I grew up in. But there was a, uh, a few months before that happened, uh, we started going to this church. Actually, a few weeks. We started going to this church. Um, and I remember that these people from this church, when, when this all happened, they showed up at our house. And these were the people that helped us to pack up our stuff and, and move into the two-bedroom apartment that we found. And then they would come back. And they would bring meals, and they would give meals to our family just to make sure we were all right, check in on us. They would show up at Christmas time. I remember there's was, there was some guys that would show up on a regular basis, and they would just come hang out with my brother and I. They, they taught me how to throw a football, like a, a spiral on a football. I remember, I remember going outside, and they would teach me different things like that, and we had so much fun. I had spiritual fathers that would step into my life from time to time. They would come up and show us like, how to do things or fix things at the house, different things like that. So my spiritual family showed me the love of God in a very real and tangible way. And get, there's two of them. There's two types of families. There's blood family. There's spiritual family. And it's, it's important for us to get this right. So today, the, the topic that I want to hit on today is this idea that we want to build a strong and lasting family. And when I talk about this, it's not just about blood family. I think that's a big part of it. But it's also about a spiritual family. You know, again, when I say spiritual family, it's, it's believers in Jesus. I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but maybe there's somebody on TV and they talk about Jesus, and you just feel a connection. Like, you never met them before. You just kind of feel this connection. That's, that's that spiritual family kicking in. Like, when we, when we believe in Jesus, like, we become brothers and we become sisters we become part of a spiritual family, and it's very important to God. And we have to get this right. Because when we get this right, a lot of other things happen in our lives that are right. It really sets the stage for good things to take place when we have good, strong relationships. You know this. If, if your spouse and you are having a hard time, then everything else kind of drops. If, your kids, if you're not getting well, along with your kids, like everything else has a bitter taste to it. We need to make sure we get this right both the blood and the spiritual side of it. So I, I want to talk through how do we do this? How do we get it right? Um, the, the tallest building in the world right now is the Burj 
Khalifa. And it's found in the city of Dubai. It's a, it's a, a city in Saudi Arabia. In fact, um, Saudi Arabia decided that they, they want to be a world-class uh, country with a world-class city. So one of the big things they did is they, they said, we're going to make a statement. We're going to build the tallest building in the world. And they, they not only made it the tallest building by, by a little bit, they made it the tallest building in the world by a lot. In fact, it's going to be really hard to break this record. It's a, it's a very tall building. Um, well, Dubai is desert. Like, the whole country is basically a big desert and have a lot of oil money, but they decided to build these big, strong, tall buildings. And for this building in particular, they had to uh, dig down uh, three stories just to kind of lay this foundation, but even that wasn't good enough. They had to drill pillars even deeper into the ground to go past all the sand to finally get to bedrock and then anchor it into the bedrock. And then from there, they had a strong enough foundation so that this building that was going hundreds of meters up in the air could stand up against the storms that would happen. Because in the desert, there's these windstorms that would take place, and they would kick up a lot of dust. And it, it would be sustained winds that would blow against the building, and they need to make sure that it would be, uh, be able to stand up against that. So the pillars allow this to take place. Well, in the, in the same way, if we're going to build a strong and lasting family, we've got to have pillars, pillars that go down into the bedrock, the bedrock of God's word. Like, that's the big thing that I figured out in my life. You know, growing up and kind of growing up in church, there's certain things that God teaches us that just guide us through life. In fact, there's, there's five pillars that I've found that have been amazing in my life. I, and I didn't call them five pillars kind of growing up, but over and over again, I was taught these things, and they became pillars in my life. They helped me to make decisions, really big decisions in my life. Looking back, I can, I can see that now. In fact, right now, these five pillars, I've written them down, and I, I put them on, on the wall in my house. So if you walk into my house and you sit down at our, our dining room table, you'll see these on the wall. Because And my, my kids and I, we sit around, and my wife, and we, we talk about these things on a regular basis. We talk about these pillars, and they, they ground us. I, I remember the, this pillar guided me as I was looking, um, looking to answer the question, should I marry her or not? So I asked Melissa to, to, to marry me, and it was great. It's been a great decision. I'm glad I did that. She's in the room, by the way, so yeah. <laughs> so uh, it also guided us. As Melissa and I, was, we were just trying to decide, like, do we have one child or two or three or four? Let's go for four. So it guided us through that. It, it guided us as we decided, hey, should we move to Florida or should we stay in Kansas? Should we go to Florida and be part of a new church? And is that is that sane to do something like that? It guided us towards, hey, do we do we homeschool our kids or do we not? Or do, what is it? before you know homeschooling was cool and necessary? Like we we had to make a decision. Like what are we gonna do? So the pillars don't tell us exactly what to do. It's not like that's in the Bible. Like you can't you aren't gonna find those specific answers. But but there are pillars that guide us. They're given to us from God, from his word, to guide us in the decisions that we make. So I'm, I'm going to let you know the pillars, so don't worry, it's coming. I, I just, just not yet. I have to set it up first. In fact, uh, in just a, f a few moments, when we're just about to end, uh, I'll tell you the pillars, and it'll be great. In fact, Devin will come up, and he'll start playing on the piano. When I say the words and the pillars, it's going to feel awesome. And you're going to want to do it. It's going to be awesome. But I have to set it up first. So there's two value systems, and we get to choose between these two systems. There's the world's value system, and then there's God's value system. Now, I, I remember, uh, man, it's been a little while now. Melissa and I went on a cruise. We, we love going on cruises. Actually, we haven't been on a cruise since we had kids because that messes things up a little bit. But we used to love going on cruises, and we, we went to the uh, cruise, and we, one of the stops was in the Bahamas. We went to Atlantis, uh, not too far from here uh, in South Florida. And I remember in Atlantis, it's this huge resort. We had like one day to do all the water slides and everything. We had a great time. But there's this huge poster, and on the poster was, was a, a kid, and, and it said, Justin Bieber. And I hadn't ever heard of Justin Bieber before, but I thought it was kind of strange. Like Atlantis, like this really luxur luxurious uh, resort, was having this kid come in and perform. I was like, wow, that's kind of strange. 
So it's the first time I heard of Justin Bieber. And so I came back, of course, from the trip. I was like, oh, okay, that's who Justin Bieber is. And, you know, we, we all kind of, well, most of us probably know who he is uh, today. But recently, I, I saw this interview with Justin Bieber. And he began to unpack his testimony, his come to Jesus testimony. And I was like, oh, wow. So he talked about, you know, as a young kid, like he, he grew up. And he grew up in the, uh, the world system. See, the, the, the world system says it's, it's money and it's social status. And then you'll have everything you want. Money, social status, you'll get everything. So Justin began to talk about his life and he began to talk about how he had everything the world could offer. He had all the money he could want. He had all the social status. And it's like, to the extreme, I mean, everything that we could possibly say that we want, like he had it and to the extreme, yet he found himself in a very lonely place, a dark place. I mean, he, he, he was arrested in Miami. <laughs> he, he got hooked on drugs. His marriage fell apart. Everything that was important to him fell apart because he had built his life on the world's value system. And the thing about the world's value system is that it looks good, it sounds good, it seems like it's going to work, it feels right. But the thing about the world's value system, and this is how the Bible puts it, it wants to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's what Justin described. And then he talked about how he met Jesus and he's begun to turn his life around. And now he's adopted a new value system in his life. God's value system, and, and what it looks like is this. It's God and it's family, and then everything else falls in place. Put God first, put family next, and then everything else will fall into place. Now, 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 in this interview, Justin would be the first one to say, like, he's not getting it all right, but man, he is living a much better life than he was before, even though he had everything the world's value system could offer today. He has joy that he never had before because now he's living the life that God intended for him to have. So I want to challenge you to make your choice. What value system are you going to choose? We, we have a choice. We have a choice of what value system we're going to pass on to our kids. Are we going to pass down blessing? Or are we going to pass down something that's going to destroy them? The Bible puts it like this. In fact, Matthew chapter 7 talks about this parable. And a parable, by the way, is just a story that has a, a lesson to it. Jesus used this a lot. In fact, this is one of the parables that, that he uh, talked about. So we're just going to read through it. It says, therefore, and th by the way, Jesus is talking. This is Jesus talking. So picture him telling this story. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who builds his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like the foolish man who builds his house on the sand. The rains came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash." So in this parable, there's three promises. The first promise is that bad things will happen. We will have trouble. We will have a storm in our life. So what we need to do is prepare for that. In fact, when I moved to Florida, one of the things I noticed is that you guys down here in South Florida, houses are built differently than they are in Kansas. Whenever I see houses being built in Kansas, it's wooden studs, and they put everything together on these wooden studs. But here in South Florida, it's cement blocks. And, and the reason is, down here, there's these, these things called hurricanes. And in South Florida, it's actually, so this is called the Sunshine State, um, and it's true, like, there's, a, there's really good weather down here. January and February are amazing. I used to, my, my least favorite month of the year was February, but now it's like my favorite month of the year. 
It's amazing. I love it. But you don't build the house for the sunny days. You, you build a cinder block house for the storm because the storm will come. So you prepare for that. And, and that's, what, that's what we need to do as Christians, as believers in Jesus, even if, as not believers in Jesus. That's why we do what we do. In fact, let me put it this way. If, if you're not a believer in Jesus, you might think, hey, how could a good God do, like, let bad things happen? You know, I kind of hear that from time to time. How, how does a good God that you talk about that's in the Bible, how, how do they let bad things happen? Well, the truth is, like, we, we don't believe that God stops bad things from happening. That's not the foundation of our faith. We actually believe that God will sustain us when bad things happen. The God of the universe sent his son, Jesus, to live on earth for 33 years. Then he was executed brutally. Like, that's a really bad storm. Yet he rose again in three days. He overcame the storm. That's the foundation of our belief. It's not that God keeps the storm from happening. It, he sustains us. And we actually come out the other side even better than when we started. Promise number two. Jesus promises us in this parable that we will have total security and success if we obey his word. The storm will come, but we will make it. One of the toughest things we've ever done is when we actually moved down to South Florida, Melissa and I, we had all sorts of crazy things happening. Everything from cars breaking down, computers crashing. I, I, have my, I, I run my own business, so computer crashing is a really big deal. Uh, phones breaking, all sorts of stuff went wrong. But I remember in the mornings I would wake up and my heart would be pounding. And I would sit down, and I would open up this book, and I'd listen to some worship music, and God would just ease the storm. We were still in it. We still had to deal with it, but God gave us peace in it. Now we're on the other side of that, and I can tell you, listen, it is awesome. God is doing some things that I never could imagine. He's blessing the decision that we made to, to, to follow his leading like I never could imagine my kids and I, we, we go explore South Florida. We have so much fun doing it. The business has taken off. It's been amazing because we listen to God's word, and it's, it's been good. But he sustains us in the storm. Promise number three, Jesus promises there is failure to anyone who does not build their house on the rock. He promises there will be failure because the storm will come. One, one of the things I love to do with my kids is go out to the beach and build something. <laughs> sometimes we build a hole, sometimes we build a castle, something. But here's what we know. Like, we can spend two, three hours building whatever, but we know it's going to go away because it's built out of sand. So we take a picture of it. Anything that's built with sand, we know it's not going to last. That's the world system. We need to realize that it's not going to last. God wants us to build on the rock. So, so why would people actually build on the sand? Like, why would people choose to do that? Well, the sand is comfortable. The sand is popular. If you go to the beach, man, you want to go on the sand. That's where everybody is. You don't go lay on the rock. Pastor Brandon actually talked about this a while ago, and he said, hey, if you go lay on the rock, this, it doesn't conform to you like the sand does. You conform to it. It bends you, and it makes you have indentations all over. But that's exactly what God wants. He wants us to conform to him. It's not about the world's truth. It's about God's truth. So we need to build our lives on that, on this idea that we are going to anchor ourselves into God's word. I don't know if you've ever been to Ikea and tried to put together something, uh, we bought an entertainment center for a wall, and, you know, it's beautiful, and it's big, and Ikea, and it looks amazing. And then you go, and you pick it up, and it's in a box. The box weighs like 1,000 pounds. And then you get it home, and you open it up, and there's a, a million pieces. <laughs> but you, you get this book, and it's, a, it's instructions, and they tell you how to put it together. 
And it's actually really good instructions. They walk you through step by steps, and 48 hours later, I mean, you can have something really great. <laughs> but if they didn't include the instructions, like, you would be on your own to figure it out. Like, you'd open the box, and you, you'd probably get some pieces and kind of hodgepodge and put it together. It'd be extremely frustrating, <laughs> and it'd take you way longer to try to do it that way. God has given us a book for life. And if we do it, we get further faster, and the results are amazing. We just have to choose to do it. It's our choice. And I want to challenge you to, to build a family, a strong family that lasts. Choose what system you're going to follow. I, I'll just give you a couple practical examples of what this has looked like. So in my life early on, um, I, uh, I heard this, this concept of serving, like serv- serving people, like, like loving God by loving others. So as a teenager, I started serving in kids' ministry. So I would teach kids in, in the kids' class at church. And I uh, got very involved in puppets and magic thing, tricks and all sorts of stuff. It, it was great, but I just served because that's what the Bible taught, was to serve others, to love God by loving others, loving others that can't even give you any feedback. Like a little kid doesn't tell you, you did a great job. They just tell you when you do bad. <laughs> like that was a bad trick. But in, in serving, that's where I actually met Melissa. Melissa is my wife now, but that's where I met her. We got to know each other. Early on in, in our, uh, our marriage, Melissa and I decided that we were going to be tithers. We were going to tithe 10% of our income, give it back to God. Right off the top, before anything else, we're going to be tithers. And I can't tell you time and time again how God has blessed us financially. He's provided for us. In fact, one specific time, we, uh, we decided it was time for kids. We we're just about ready to start this crazy journey. We didn't know what we are getting into, but we're, it was time for kids. And so we, uh, we shared this with uh, just some friends of ours and they actually had three kids. I actually sat down with them and like, hey, how did you, how'd you do this? And kind of talked to them. Well, they came up to us and um, he gave us the keys to his SUV. And he said, you're going to need this. <laughs> he gave us an SUV. And we used that thing for child number one, two, three. And then when we got word that four was coming, we're like, oh. We need to let go of the SUV. We got to get the minivan. So now we have the minivan. There's buttons for everything. It's great. But God has provided for us over and over again because we stand on God's word. Sometimes it doesn't make sense, but if we just trust it and do it, God makes sure that it works out. So ways that we build a strong and lasting family. So again, this is really important, guys. We have to get this right. It's our blood family. We know this is important. We know that having good relationships with the people that are closest to us will help life become better. If those relationships aren't great, it doesn't matter what we accomplish, there's a bitterness to it. We have to get it right. We have to get it spiritually. We need to surround ourselves with spiritual family, brothers and sisters that will cheer us on and surround us in our highest moments and in our lowest moments. We have to get this right. So the way we do this is first we have to decide what story are we going to tell. We have to be intentional about it. The second thing is we have to build on God's truth, not the truth of our culture. It's it's amazing how, in fact, our culture celebrates what's opposite of God's word. I mean, you can you can just look around our our the, the mall. You can look around on TV and you can see that it's celebrating things that God says. Actually, that's that's not the way to do it. But that's what culture does. It it promises something, but then it goes away. But if we build on God's word and on God's truth, it will last. We have to choose to do that. It's our choice. So I want to present to you the the five pillars, and I think this will help you. These are the five. If If we were to take a lot of what we teach here at Vibrant Church and really boil it down, like it's it's kind of these five things that we talk about over and over and over again. And we need to make it a foundation of our life. Um, I know this is kind of risky, but let me do this. We need to stand on God's word, right? We need to make this the foundation. 
and our whole life, when we do this, when we make God's word our foundation, the storms will come. It's okay. Because we, we're going to make it. We can have confidence and peace to know that God is with us. We're going to come out stronger. The first pillar is to know God. I want, I want this for you. I want you. I want this for you. I want this for my kids. We talk about this all the time, to know God. Not just to know about him, but to, know, to be in relationship with him. We come to church. We spend time in the morning with him. In, in fact, if you don't do this, I want to, Pastor Brandon shared this before too. Take 15 minutes. Get up a little bit earlier. Take 15 minutes to start your day off by setting yourself on the foundation of God's word. Take five minutes. Listen to worship mu- music. Take five minutes. Read God's word. Take five more minutes and pray. Set your day up on the foundation of God's word, knowing God, hearing from him. The second one is to build family. Be intentional with your relationships. Plan them. Plan times around them. This is something that I'm working on. Oh, man, I've just talked to Melissa about, hey, we need to go on more dates. Actually, Pastor Brandon was telling us about how him and John go on dates once every seven days. I'm like, oh, man, that'd be good. We should do that. We need to build family. We need to build our kids stronger, build church family, be around good people. We need to find freedom. That's friends, having good friends around us that will encourage us, good godly people. That's why we come to church. That's why Vibrant Church exists and connect groups. We get to surround ourselves with good people that will help us to find freedom in our life. Not not point us towards bondage and bad things, but but will help us to find freedom, real freedom. We want to discover purpose. That's number four. Discover purpose means to grow, become better, to become a better version of ourselves, to read and to, to, uh, to learn things, to come to church where we learn things, to, to read books and to listen to books. One of the things I do is have an Audible account that I just read books, listen, listen to books, because <laughs> um, it's a little bit easier for me to do it that way. I just want to learn, become better. That's the way God gets to develop the purpose that he has for us inside of us. And then finally, we want to make a difference. We want to serve others. We want, we want to make a difference in the lives of others, to use what God has given us in service to somebody else. That looks different for each and every one of us. But when we, when we build our lives on these five pillars, we're building a moat around our lives. In, in business, they call, it, they call it the moat. And the moat is where like, you build a business and it's got this protection around it where somebody can't just come and just take it away from you one day. You're building a a moat. So I want to use that analogy here. You're building a moat 360 degrees around you where the enemy can't take what you have because you're building it on the foundation of God's word. These are the five pillars, and I hope you write them down. I hope you learn more about them. In fact, if you come to Vibrant Church, you will learn more and more about each of these five pillars But the key is this. We need to build our lives, build our foundation on God's word. uh, There's a businessman who um, was very, very, very successful. He went to this conference, and he was talking to a bunch of really successful businessmen, other business people, men and women. And they were sharing all sorts of tips and tricks and how well things are working. And then he started talking about family. And this, this guy, he was the most successful of all of them by far. His business was the most successful, but he got really quiet when the, the, when the family discussion came up. And at the end of it, they, someone asked him, hey, I noticed you got really quiet. What's, what's going on? He's like, you know, I, I'm really successful in business, but my kids don't know me. I talk with my assistant more than I talk to my kids. and They're almost grown, and they don't even know who I am. I don't know who they are. It doesn't matter how successful we are if we don't get this right there's a bitterness that happens. So we need to make sure we, we build a strong and lasting family because it's God's plan for us. He, this, is, this is what helps us to really enjoy and, and step into all that God has for us. In fact, Melissa and I, we, we heard this sermon a little while ago, and we, we, uh, we've adopted this idea uh, f- for us. And the idea is this. If, we have lots of plans. In fact, I don't know if you guys have created a bucket list but there's a bucket list of all these things that we want to do. I think there's like 115 or so things that we, we want to do. But we said this, if, if nothing else happened, if all that happened, whatever happens, at the end of it, we, we just want to like each other. We, we want to 
We want to want to be with each other when we're not with each other. Like, that's the goal. We just need to build our lives so that we enjoy each other, that our kids enjoy being with us, that our kids enjoy being with each other. And I feel like that's, that's the goal of all this. We need to build a strong and lasting family. God has called us to it. He wants to be your heavenly father. He wants to guide you through it. And my prayer is that he would show you what this looks like. There's different things we all need to work on in different parts of our lives. And my, my prayer this week is that God would reveal to you the relationships that you need to work on, that he would reveal to you your next steps that you need to take to build a strong, who's that person that you need to talk to? You haven't talked to him in a while. What are the words you need to say to somebody that you haven't said, but you know you need to say? Heavenly Father, we just come before you today. God, we surrender to you and to your ways. God, I ask that you would speak to us, lead us and guide us, Lord, that we would build something substantial, that we would be rooted and grounded in the rock of your word, in your ways, that we would surrender ourselves to you and do what you're asking us to do. In Jesus' name.